Genesis chapter 24, starting in verse 1. We'll wait for the for the Bible screen guy. <laughs> the servant of the Lord. Hallelujah. He takes off his guitar hat and puts on his computer hat. All right, here we go. Start in verse 1. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house, whose name this part of the passage doesn't mention it, but his name is Eleazar, the servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. This is a way back in the Old Testament times that they would swear a covenant with one another. This is one way that they would do it. Put the hand under the master's thigh and he's like essentially giving a promise to Abraham that he will accomplish what Abraham's asking of him. Uh, it is stated that had, had he failed in what he promised that he would do, that the seed of Abraham after him would hold the servant accountable. So it says, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. So right there, just real quick, I mean, we're going to talk a little bit more about it, but I want you to remember the fact that Abraham, I don't usually, I haven't done this in a while, but we'll do it. Abraham, so this is this is our map of Israel, okay? This would be uh, the, sea, the Sea of Galilee. This is the Jordan River, and this is the Dead Sea. And this area between the two, this is the coast of the Mediterranean here. This is the Jordan River. This area here is Israel. This is the, this is the borders of the nation of Israel, the northern and the southern part. Then there were two more rivers over here, the Tigris and the Euphrates. This area between these two rivers is known as Mesopotamia. That's what that word means. It literally means the land between the rivers. Okay. <laughs> This is now modern day Iraq, this area here. And this air, this there was a little town down here called Ur, and there was a town near Ur that was also called Nahor. This is where the story that we're talking about is going to take place. Part of it is in this place called Nahor down here in southern, near uh, uh, southern Iraq. But if you'll remember that God called Abraham out when he lived over here. Uh, Ur of the Chaldees. It's actually like a 450 mile journey from, from one place to the other. But God had called Abraham out of here and called him to wander in this area here. This is ultimately the area that God would give to Abraham, but Abraham never actually saw that part of the promise fulfilled. He continued, God had promised that he would give his people a place, okay? And now this is modern day Israel, the area that we're talking about. So all of this came to pass, but Abraham never saw it. So basically what he's saying to the servant right there is, he's saying, don't, because this land before it was Israel was known as what? Does anybody remember? Canaan. Canaan. That's exactly right. This this area here was known as Canaan. It was the land of the Canaanite. So at this time, whenever Abraham is living there, it's Canaan. It's the land of the Canaanite. And the nation of Israel has not been produced yet. The nation of Israel does not yet exist. The nation of Israel only exists in the fact that Abraham has had the first seed. Isaac is now alive. And this is part of what that story is. So essentially Abraham saying, don't go get a wife for my son from the people. Like in other words, if I die before you're able to accomplish all of this, you're swearing to me. You put your hand under my thigh. You're swearing to me. You will not get a wife from my son from these Canaanite people. All right. And instead you will go back to where I come from and you will get a wife <coughs> for my son from there. So we're going to, I just want to make sure that we're all on the literal understanding of this. And so we'll keep on going. He says, but thou shalt go into my country and to my kindred and take a wife <coughs> Unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Per adventure, or I have a little doubt in my heart, is basically what he's saying. Uh, what if she won't come? Per adventure, the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from where you came? And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou bring not my son there again. 
don't take a wife from my son from here, but don't you bring my son back over there. You go fetch him a bride from that place. And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou bring not my son there again. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred or my kinfolk. Now you can say it like that. And which spoke unto me and that swear unto me, saying unto your seed, will I give this land. Talk about that land right there. He shall send his angel before you and shall take and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from there. And if the woman will not be willing to follow you, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring my son that only only bring not my son there again. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning the matter. I titled this morning's message <laughs> Search and Rescue. This is a story that's nestled in the early stages of God's salvation plan. It takes place before there's ever a nation called Israel. It takes place before there's even a grandson named Israel. You, you remember the you remember how the name Israel came about. I know that many of you remember that, but but Isaac, Abraham's son, is gonna have a son named Jacob, right? And Jacob's name is going to be changed in the midst of a trial in his life. The worst night of his life. He's stricken with fear. He doesn't know how he's going to get to where God is wanting to bring him. He knows that there's a promise that was given to his grandfather Abraham, but he doesn't know how he's going to get there. His older brother wants to kill him. And on that night, the Bible says that Jacob wrestled with God. Jacob all of his life, had the call of God on his life, was a child of God, a believer of God, yet desired to do things according to his own will, an unwillingness to be broken in the eyes of God, an unwillingness to surrender to the will of, will of God. But on that night, when he had no way of knowing how he was going to get where he was going, he, the Bible says he wrestled with God. And when it was all said and done, the Bible says God could not even prevail against him. That doesn't mean that God wasn't stronger than him. That means that sometimes man's will refuses to submit and surrender to the will of God. And so because of that, the Bible says that God touched him in his hip. And from that day moving forward, amen, Jacob never was the same. His name was changed from Jacob, which is a form of meaning deceiver, to Israel which means prince of God or one who will rule with God. But listen, he limped from that day moving forward. The point to this part of my story is I'm just trying to say this is even before that. This is before there ever is a Jacob. We're in the time frame of Abraham's life where Isaac is born, but there is no Jacob. There is no nation called Israel. But all Abraham has is the <coughs> promise that God had given him. And now he has a son named Isaac and he wants a bride for her and he sends his servant to go and fetch a bride. And in the midst of this story where we are, he's already been called to separate himself from his prior life, from his family. At this point, he's old and Isaac, his son, needs a bride. And on the surface, this is a literal story of people's lives, right? We can see within this culture how different it was back then. I mean, if you're interested in the history of the Bible, which I love to know the history of the Bible because it helps me to understand the scriptures better. They arranged, they prearranged the weddings back then. And, and so Abraham sending his servant to go and to find this young lady, whoever she may be. But spiritually, I need you to understand something. The, but God doesn't write things on accident. God's purposeful. How, what a God we serve. What a word. What a living word. The Bible says, Hebrews 4, that the word of God is quick. It means it's alive and it's powerful. Hallelujah. That, you know, the word of God is alive. Within the Old Testament stories, even within New Testament stories, how, how can you explain a God who, who writes with a pen that's alive? The, the paper is alive. The point that I'm trying to make is within the characters' lives, the story of the gospel is played out thousands of years before there's ever even a, before there's ever even a nation, much less Jesus being born of the lineage of Abraham, the God becoming flesh. Before thousands of years before all of that, God writes within the stories of these individual people's lives the gospel message played out 
time and again. We're about to get to that. I want you to know, though, that spiritually, this is an illustration of how God sends his word to the lost and how he allows them the opportunity to marry themselves to his son through being born again. Wow. It's important that we understand something that when a person is born again, a spiritual miracle takes place. Amen. <laughs> Amen. When you're converted, there's a miracle that takes place on the inside of the heart. Amen. And whenever this miracle takes place, they become a new person. The Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of them. I was having a conversation with my older sister last night, and we're just kind of talking back and forth, and she was sharing with me some <laughs> concerns, you know, about having to do with her own children and things like that. And we just started talking in general, you know. I don't know if you've ever had conversations with people. I'm sure many of you have about the gospel. Amen. And, and, and you know, sometimes we wonder, well, what is it that... That shows that a person saved. Now, I don't mean to get too deep right here, but I, but I am going to mention this. And I've shared it with you before. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 10 that you must believe with the heart and confess with the mouth. Now, I have to tell you that churches are filled with people that have confessed something with their mouth. They've prayed a prayer, you know, and listen, I don't want to beat up a prayer of salvation because I don't think that it's always a bad thing to have people pray. But at the same time, the scripture is clear. You must believe with the heart. Who, who knows who believes with the heart? I'm asking a question. That's an interrogative. Who knows who truly believes? Do you know? No, only God, the Holy Spirit knows who really believes with the heart. That's not really our job. Now, you can see the fruit in people's lives, but listen, the truth be told, Lord knows each and every one of us in this room has truly believed in the heart and confessed with the mouth and felt the Holy Spirit move into our hearts and at the same time never completely surrendered to the point where there was any fruit in our lives. Come on, somebody. Help me out here, right? But, but, but one, of the, one of the things that I've learned as I've studied the scripture, man, and this has really been on my heart, Ephesians 1.13, when you hear the gospel of truth and you believe it from the heart and you confess it with your mouth, a miracle takes place. That's what I'm talking about right now. A miracle of conversion, a miracle of being born again. And when a man or a woman is born again, something happens in the spiritual realm. You want to know what happens? The Holy Spirit comes to move on the inside of your heart. He makes your heart his home. Listen, that's what makes the Old Testament or the Old Covenant different than the New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit was with man. In the New Covenant, the Holy Spirit lives in man. Hallelujah. This story that we're talking about this morning is an illustrative story. Yes, it's literal. Yes, it tells us the narrative, the history of Abraham, of Israel, where they, where Israel came from. We can learn these things. It's important that we understand these things. But there's an illustration here about how the gospel goes forward. And whenever people embark upon the journey, a miracle happens in their life. You must be born again. It's important that we remember that as the children of God, as the church of God, as the house of God, that Listen, just because people say that they're okay, no, man must be born again. Amen. It doesn't do good enough to believe with the head. Yes. Countless millions believe with the head. Amen. The devils believe with the head. The same word in the Greek. You believe there's one God, you do well. The devils also believe, yet they tremble. That's right. De demon spirits have, I don't understand, I've never met one, don't want to. Maybe I met him, but I just didn't, don't know him by name and don't want to know him by name. Amen? Well, let me say something. Demon spirits have some form of intellectual knowledge. Well, how do you know that? Because whenever Jesus walked up, they said, oh, old son of man, you've come before the appointed time. They knew who he was. They have some kind of intellectual capacity. But just because they know Jesus is real, just because they believe, they believe me, they believe that Jesus is the, is, is the one that God sent. They know he is. Amen. But just because they believe with their head doesn't, you, a demon spirit can't be saved. Just because people believe with their head doesn't mean that they believe with the heart. I'm kind of getting off the beaten trail right here. What I'm really wanting to say is this, is that the gospel message goes forward. People respond. And when they respond through faith, believing in the heart, confessing with the mouth, a spiritual miracle takes place on the inside of their heart. Their internal 
spirit man is completely transformed. The Bible teaches that that was going to happen in the old covenant. Jeremiah 500, 600 years before Jesus would ever show up said that. He said that there was going to be a new covenant, not one where he, the commandments or the law of God was written on, on tablets of stone, but instead on the inside of man's heart. How does God write his law on the inside of man's heart? Because when you get saved and you receive the earnest or the down payment of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who authored the law comes to live on the inside of your heart. Long before you ever killed somebody, he told you not to hate them. Long before you ever committed adultery, he told you not to lust after them in your heart. Long before you ever did whatever you did, he told you to stop and put the Breaks on the problem that man has is that we don't desire many times our will is contrary to the will of God and we refuse to surrender to God's will. Yeah. Ezekiel 36 said that. He said in the new covenant it was going to be different. He was going to take the heart of stone out and he was going to put a heart of flesh. Amen. And that he was going to renew our spirit. Oh, but this is the good part. He was going to put his spirit on the inside of us. Amen. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us the strength that we need to walk according to his statutes and his judgment. You try to live for God in your own strength. You try to walk according to a set of rules and regulations in your own power. You, know, you get some things done, but that's the easy stuff. That's the stuff you didn't want to do anyway. You're right? But, but all the stuff that you really, really, really has, has a hold on you. No, unless the Lord sets you free. You will fall oh, Louis, that's right. again and again. Yes. Spiritually, this story is an illustration. When people give their lives, amen, the Holy Spirit lives in them, gives them a desire to live a new life, desires to move away from where they've always been before. This girl, Rebecca, she didn't know anything but this. This was her way of life. Desires to move forward to the place that he wants to bring them. Contained in this story are some characters. I love to talk about stories, to set it up like that. The characters in this story are like the Trinity and the believer. There's a father in this story. Yeah. A father that has a plan. A plan that he would find a bride for his son. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you can't get no better than that. A son who was born under miraculous circumstances. Abraham was 99, Sarah was 90. She scoffed at the notion that her barren womb could produce offspring. <laughs> but yet God did a spiritual miracle. There's so much to be preached right there. I mean, when you get to the end of yourself, hallelujah, and you can't go no more, and you basically have given up on self, that's just when God's getting started. <laughs> Amen? But here, not only was he born under miraculous circumstances, like Jesus was born of the virgin when she was overcome by the Holy Ghost, he carried wood on his back up a hill. <laughs> he carried wood up his, on his back up a hill and he was placed on an altar to be sacrificed. But instead was miraculously spared as though he had been resurrected from the dead. Uh, yeah. What a story, huh? There's also a servant who operates like the Holy Spirit. He tells the story about the message of the father and the content of the message is all about the son. I can't help myself. I thought about this this morning. I don't know why I always pick on them and because they're talking false doctrine. That's why. But the Jehovah's Witnesses. I remember one time I was just sitting in a parking garage because, boy, like every time I get a chance, I talk to these people because I want to learn one new little thing. And one time it hit me. He kept talking about Jehovah this, Jehovah that, Jehovah this, Jehovah that. Now, we know Jesus is the manifestation of Jehovah. Amen. The physical representation of the eternal God. Finally, though, the Holy Spirit said, why you don't ever talk about my son? Because my whole word is written about my son. It pleased the father that in all fullness in him would dwell all the fullness. Yes, I asked him that. I said, man, let me, let me ask you a question. The whole Bible is written about Jesus. The, the whole thing, the New Testament repeats him time and time and time again. Well, why are you going to ever talk about Jesus? It said it pleased the father that in, that in him would be the fullness. All things have been placed under his feet, but you ain't said his name one time. The Father gave us Jesus. Why don't you ever talk about him? What I'm trying to say is this is that the content of the message, when the Holy Spirit goes before, he's telling the, the future bride about the son, the whole content of the message is, would you come back and would you marry the son? But there's also a bride to be, the sinner that will soon be converted to a saint. The first point that I want to talk to you about is the fact that his love searches far. Point number one is love searches far. Look at Genesis 24, verse 4. This is Abraham again talking to the servant. He says, 
you shall go unto my country and to my kindred. Go to my kinfolk, take a wife unto my son Isaac. Now I want you to know that the distance, I already wrote it up on the board, from where Abraham was in the land of Canaan before it was named Israel, back to Nahor, this town in, in Iraq, was about the same distance as Morgan City from San Antonio. This was 450 miles. San Antonio from Morgan City is about 480. About the same distance. Can you imagine that journey? Yeah. He also had 10 camels with him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, walking, a, okay, riding a camel. In a rocky, desert, somewhat mountainous terrain. I don't even know how long. I tried. Google couldn't even tell me how long that was. I didn't want to spend that much time on it. But my point is, is this, is that how long does that take? How grueling of a journey is that? I'm trying to make a point that God's love searches far. Amen? Look at Luke chapter 15, 1 through 10. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners. <clears throat> tax collectors is what that word publican means and, and just sinners in general prostitutes and tax collectors we've talked about tax collectors before how they were the how they were considered the worst by the children of Israel they wanted to come and hear him and the Pharisees and the scribes murmured so the sinners come to hear Jesus but the religious folk murmur and what do they say this man receives sinners well yeah he, Jesus said that the son of man came to save that which was lost don't ever let the world or religion, especially religion, lie to you. <clears throat> religion will try to lie to you and will try to pick and poke at every little thing that's wrong with your, pers your personal life. Don't get me wrong. The Holy Spirit wants us to get things right. Amen. I ain't trying to condone that we just live any old way we want to. But what I'm trying to say is that religion will try to pick and poke and tear you down. That's what the Pharisees were always doing. That is what they murmured. This man receives sinners. He eats with them. And then he spoke this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if you lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repents more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Hallelujah. The Pharisees needed repentance more than the, than the lost sheep. Amen. But they just Amen. couldn't see it. That's really what Jesus is talking about. You're so sick you don't even know you need a doctor. The re that, you know, that's one of the things that, that the Lord has, and I don't mean to get off the path. We're about to talk about the second little part of the parable. But... That's one of the things that I realized. People that smoke crack, they generally know that they're in a bond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People that are living in fornication, committing adultery, they generally know that they're not doing right, especially if they know anything about the Lord. Yeah. People that are drinking and doing whatever, <clears throat> like, you know, if the Lord's convicted their heart, they know that it's not right. The religious heart, they can't even see it's not right. Yeah. Because everything that it does, it believes that it's doing for God. But yet, whenever you have a spirit of religion, it blinds your eyes to the fault that is in your own life and in your own heart. Yeah, I've often, I felt like the Lord showed me a long time ago that it's so much easier. Now, I'm speaking in, in man's terms. There's nothing impossible for God. We get all that. But it's so much easier for God to deliver a sinner that knows that he's messed up than it is for him to deliver the religious of heart. Because the religious of heart doesn't even feel like he needs anything. God figured out, Lord. Here's the next part of the parable. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she loses one piece, does not light a candle, sweep the house, and diligently seek till she finds it. And when she's found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the piece which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. The idea of these two passages that I'm trying to make is that God searches for sinners. He looks for the lost. Rebecca didn't even know it, but her destiny was 450 miles away. God sent us Jesus to make us aware of who he is and the fact that he wants to have a relationship with us. Look at John chapter 1 verse 14. 
John 1.14 says, The Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. This passage of Scripture has so much meaning. It, 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 the word dwelt, and I've taught this before, but the word in the Greek literally means sanctuary. Yeah. Just like the Old Testament tabernacle, tent, that the Holy Spirit's presence lived in, basically what this word in the Greek is saying is Jesus before we got saved, before he died on the cross, was like the Old Testament tabernacle that within him dwelled the literal presence of God. Yes. Mankind was in the midst of darkness and God sent light from heaven to earth. Hallelujah. And his presence dwelled within Jesus and tabernacled in Jesus. Yes. What I'm trying to tell you is the word that spoke the worlds into existence became flesh so that he could tabernacle with us and reveal the glory of God to us. God had to get his message to his people. Come on, Amen. The very word that spoke the worlds into existence revealed himself to us. Jesus came from afar and he searches for the lost. And like Eliezer traveled 450 miles to find a bride for Isaac. The Lord travels far for the lost sheep. He searches high and low, turning over every rock, looking for another lost sinner, just like the lady looked for the coin. Some people say, oh, but I'm too far. I'm in too dark of a place. The Lord will never find me here. That's not what the word of God said. Right. You can't move, run far enough, fast enough, get into a play, valley that's deep, too deep or too dark for God to be able to find you. The psalmist said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. Hallelujah. Yes. God said he'll prepare a table for you in front of your enemies. Yes, Maybe you're going through something. Maybe you're in school. Maybe you're at work and you're going through something. And you feel as though the people that, that are around you are coming against you. You just keep trusting God. You keep asking the Lord, amen, to reveal his truth to you. That his grace would flow in you and through you. He said, I'll prepare a table for you. Even in the midst of your enemies. Listen to me, they might come against you in all kinds of different ways, but the Lord said that he, that, 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 that they won't overcome you, amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. Sometimes people feel like they're too far, but that's not what the Word of God says. God's love reaches far. Point number two, his love comes from somewhere else. Genesis 24-7 the Lord God of heaven, this is Abraham talking, which took me from my father's house. Abraham came from somewhere else. Yes. Amen. God called him to this land of Canaan, the land of promise that would one day be called Israel. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred and which spoke unto me and that swear, um, swear unto me, saying unto your seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before you. And you shall take a wife unto my son from there. <laughs> Abraham was from another place. He was different than the people around him. Yeah. The Canaanites had no desire to serve God. And to be truthful, you'll find one here and there. You know, Rahab the harlot, she gave her heart to... But for the most part, they don't want to live for God. It's the world. The story is a type of God reaching out and going after the lost and bringing them home. Just as the servant was foreign to Rebecca, God's love is foreign to us. I'm telling you, I love this scripture. I probably use it too much. But here it is. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. It says, Behold. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knew, knows us not because it knew him not. Yes. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall, he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Boy, there's a lot to be said about that passage. Yes, you can preach a whole message just on those verses. In other words, there's more to the story than what meets the eye today. We don't even know what it's going to completely look like, but we do know this. We're going to be like him, not deity. You'll never be deity, but you're going to be without sin one day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're going to receive a glorified body and, and this sinful nature is finally going to be eradicated from your heart. Hallelujah. That's going to be a glorious day. Amen. You'll be able to worship the Lord the way that he deserves to be worshipped. That's right. Amen. 
Praise God. But what I'm really wanting to point out right here is what manner of love is this. <laughs> The word manner right there, the essence of that, the, the scripture centers around the word manner. And this word describes the fact that God's love is foreign. It comes from another place. The word literally, if you looked it up, it means like another tribe. You know, like you got a missionary that comes from a foreign land and he enters into a jungle and he sees a tribe for the first time. They're foreign. They ain't never seen this. They never heard this message before. God's love is like that to the human heart. God's love comes from another realm. That's why Jesus had to come from over there. To over here. This world doesn't know nothing about him. Come on. The love of God is so different than our love. Even at our best, we're selfish. That's right. The love of God is selfless. The definition of God's love is Jesus. Amen. Jesus died on a cross. He's sacrificial in nature. Mankind's heart always wants something. Well, I'm going to get out the deal. Come on, somebody. Help me yeah, out. I'm preaching right. better than your amen. The man's, man's heart always wants to know what he's going to get out the deal. What's in it for me? God's love is foreign. Rebecca has no clue that there's a son named Isaac who is a type of the promised son waiting for her, wanting to love her, wanting to spend his life with her. But the father sent a servant to tell her about the son. And if you read the whole story, you will realize that she believes the servant. She believed by faith and started the journey towards the son. Yeah. Yeah. That's what happens to us. We're exposed to God's love. He sent someone our way to tell us about his way. And then we had to make a choice by faith to start the journey. You, you, you got to make a choice by faith to get up and leave where you were and to travel in the direction of the sun. That's point. Now, point number three, the search produces a people and he gives his people a purpose and a place. Look at Genesis chapter 24, verse seven. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred and which spoke unto me and that swore unto me, saying unto your seed, will I give this land? He shall send his angel before you and you shall take a wife unto my son from there. God had originally instructed Abraham to follow him and that he would make a people out of Abraham that would be God's people. They would belong to him and he would give them a place specifically for them. I'm talking about the first scripture I'm going to look at right here is John chapter 1 verse 12. I'm talking about the fact that God promises, he promised to produce a people. God is not going to change his mind. He's producing a people on this earth. And people say, yeah, well, we're all God's children. Well, no, not really. Not really. We're all God's creation. Amen. But we're not all God's children. Look at this right here. But as many as received him. Yeah. See, you got to go back and you got to look at the whole context. It says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. It goes on to talk about the fact that nothing that you see here was created if it wasn't created through Jesus. Right. Amen. And it ultimately, he's going to say that the word became flesh. He was the light. I'm paraphrasing. But he was the light that was sent from heaven onto this darkened world. The darkness could not really... some. Translations say comprehend it, which would be more like understand it. But some translations say apprehend it. In the yeah. original language, it's both. Darkness can't understand, but also darkness could not overcome it. Right. It was God's will, God's plan. Amen. And the light came into the midst of darkness. And he sent John the Baptist to be not the light, but a witness to the light. John the Baptist is a type of the believer. John the Baptist is a type of Eleazar sharing the message to tell Rebecca, the bride, to come to the son. He's a witness. John the Baptist is a witness to the light. And as the message goes forward, those that receive him. When you receive the message of truth and you surrender to it by faith, then he gives you what? The power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, so we're not all God's children. Yes, we're all God's creation, but he is looking to produce a people. This search and rescue mission mission produces a people. That's the name of the message this morning. Search and rescue. It produces a people that are different. Look at Matthew 5.13. 
these people, he says, he's, this is Jesus preaching to his people. This is the king. This is what, that's what they would say about Matthew. Matthew's book chronicles the story of the king and his kingdom. Here's the king on the mountainside speaking to his citizens. And this is what he tells them. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Listen, the main thing I want you to see right there is this. God is producing a people and God's people have a purpose on this earth. Point number three is this. The search produces a people. He gives his people a purpose and a place. There's a place for you. Yes, this place is not your home. Peter said you're a pilgrim. The Bible says of Abraham that he looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. Amen. There's a heavenly Jerusalem, a heavenly Zion that we look forward to. A day when there will be no more pain. There will be no more tear. Amen. He's going to dry up the tears. There's going to be no more crying. We will be in the presence of God and there will be joy unspeakable. Hallelujah. And full of glory. But listen, until that day there's a purpose and God desires to make a place for his people yeah literally he made a place for Israel it was called the land of Canaan between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea but spiritually there's a place in Christ amen that God wants his children to inhabit a place where God wants his people to walk in covenant relationship with him where his Holy Spirit will move upon them and move within them and move through them Look what it says in John 17, 14 through 18. Listen, your time on this earth, until it's up, you're not, he's not done with you. Right. It, it produces a place and a purpose for his people. John chapter 17, verses 14 through 18. This is Jesus talking. He's about to go to the cross. He's praying to the Father. He's praying to the Father specifically for his disciples. Right. He said, he basically, he said, look, I said, they all saved. I still got them all except for that one, the, the son of perdition. He said, and he's talking about the word of God and how the word of God changes people and it makes it God's people different than the world. But this is what Jesus says. He says, I've given them your word and the world has hated them. You ever felt like the world hated you? <laughs> hey, don't even let this preacher tell you. Oh, maybe you're doing it all wrong. If the world hates you, maybe you're doing something right. Amen. Amen. Amen? Yes. Now, I mean, I, James is amen to love anybody in the place, but he'd be the first one to tell you. Sometimes we also got to check our hearts and make sure, on, amen, man. that we're praying and asking the Lord to move upon our hearts that our attitudes would be right as we present this glorious gospel. If we're going to be a right. messenger of this gospel, we got to make sure we don't get in the way, folks. That's right, but even when you do all of that, the word of God all by itself is just good enough to offend them and to, to cut their heart. Come on. When you tell them the truth, did you realize people don't like correction? <laughs> Have you figured that one out yet? Come on. They don't like the truth and they sure don't like correction. And when you tell them that they ain't doing something right and you give them the word of God, Yep. It'll frustrate them. Yeah. It'll frustrate church folk. <laughs> Can you imagine what that's in the world? They don't have the Holy Spirit living in them? Yeah, that's the Come on, somebody. That's just the truth right there. Yes. Jesus says this. He said, I have given them your word. The world has hated them because they are not of the world. I mean, I don't. I, this just hit, my, hit my, my mind as I was reading that. You know, racism, boy, that's a big topic now. Right? Mm -hmm. Racism. It's it seems like it's worse today than what it was. It, it started. I mean, it not really whenever I talk to people in the room. Like, I get along fine with everybody. But what the media is saying is going on out there seems worse. I tell people all the time, like, we start talking, you know, about stuff. And everybody's cool, man. We're talking. I'm like, do you remember what it was like when we were growing up? Because I'm just, just trying to say, like, we didn't like each other. Yeah, we right. didn't because we were taught not to. I'm just that's being right. real, dude. Yeah, that's right. The point that I'm trying to make is this, is that back in the day, why do we even hate people just because they have a different color skin? It doesn't make any sense. Right. Why would it? That's from the devil. That's right. That is completely from the devil. It's something different. So we don't understand it. So we freak out and we don't like it. The only reason I brought that up is because it hit me when I was reading the scripture. It says right here, it says that the world hates them because they're not of the world. Just like the racist hates something that it doesn't understand because it's of a different color or whatever, a different culture. The world 
hates the truth because it's of a different spirit and it's different than them. It hates the ways of God. Right. Now, I'm not trying to say that everybody in the world hates it, but I'm talking about the when you look at the spirit of the Antichrist and what it's doing in this world today, it hates the essence of God's word Hallelujah. and God's truth. Don't yeah. tell me that homosexuals can't live together. It would hate you. It would hate your message. Don't right. tell me that, that, you know, whatever, that we can't do whatever it is that we want to do. It would hate you and hate your message and hates God and hates God's message because it's contrary to the message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. This is God's message. This is God's Amen. word. Amen. It hates something that it doesn't understand. It's offended by it. Right. <laughs> it amazes me, man, that people get... Anyway, that's another story about that, or that whole racism thing. Where in the world? I mean, if you think about that, way back in the day, you know, whenever they were doing some of the stuff they were doing early on in this country, what? And then people... I don't even know why I'm talking about this right now, but I'm just, I'm, it's just hit me. Maybe I'm just getting a revelation of it. It's like, what in the world, dude? Where did that come from? And they called themselves Christians, right. and they were doing all that. It's another spirit. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. But anyway, the main point that I'm trying to make is, is that the world hates the message of Jesus. The world hates Jesus' people. He says, and hates them because they are not of the world. Look at this. Even as I am not of this world. I've already said this. That, I should have, that should have been the message of, of the, the, the title of the message. Not of this world. Because how many times have I said it? That he, the light came from darkness. It came from another realm. Amen. Came to this earth. But look what he says. I pray not that you would take them out of the world. Oh, that wouldn't that be easy? Oh, Lord, just take me out of this thing. Amen. I know that. Robert used to fuss. People wanted the rapture too bad. <laughs> well, I think yeah, we're supposed to want the rapture, Rob. But I get what you're saying. He's saying there's a lot of work to do. He's right. Come on. And when your heart's right, there's a balance. That's right. Come, Lord Jesus, come. But until you do, right. give us the give us the strength, Amen, and the power that we need in order to do Your will. That's what Jesus said. I'm not asking you to take them out of this world. No, but that you would keep them from the evil. Yes. Basically, the idea in the Greek is. It's got the definite article, the evil one. Keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through your truth. Listen to me. You can't afford not to be hungry for the word of God. That's right. Come on. If you're not hungry for the word of God, this is so important that you get a hold of this. If you're not hungry for the word of God, then you need to pray that the Lord will change your appetite. Yes. Come on. It's a whole lot more important than getting your, than getting your physical diet right. That's right. The words, you know what the word sanctified means? Okay, so let's just kind of use it like this. Let's say that this is the place of God. Well, we don't have to draw it over here. Let's say this is the place of God that God has for Abraham. And this is the place where he was. God took him, put him over here, and separated him in this place right here. That's right. what the word means. It means to be made holy, to be made separate. Right. Think about this. The word of God sanctifies the people of God. Yeah. How does it do that? Because it gives them a context of truth. Boy, there's a lot to be said about this right here. You Listen, if you talk to intellectual people today and you read it, uh, read behind me, some of you are like, I don't care. You shouldn't care what they say. But what I'm trying to say is one day you might get in a conversation with them. And then if you care about their soul, you yeah, should at least try to some yeah. way to meet That's them right. somewhere so where you can have a common ground to talk about. But the intellectual would say, you know, the only reason that we even think that there's a God I'm about to get into that here in a second. I think I still got some stuff to talk about regarding this. Because, because the only reason that we think that there's a God is because there's a Bible that says that there's a God. It's exactly right. Yeah. God hey. made himself aware. Just yeah. as God sent a servant to get Rebecca, he's also going throughout the world, traveling afar to let others know that he is real. Amen. They want to see God. Listen, they want some. You know what it is? This, the scientific world, and I know that this, uh, people have tried to correct me on this, and I'm not trying to say that this is literally the scientific method, but what I'm trying to say is that ultimately the scientific method, if I remember correctly, has something to do with proving your point. You got to be able to, in some way, shape, or form, prove the existence of something. Prove you got to be able to go through a process and and what and prove. Your, your point. Amen. And that's basically what the world wants of God. 
They want to, they want to apply the scientific method to him. They want to be able to see him, touch him, feel him, smell him. And if they came, then they want to say, oh, well, he's not real. No, God has made himself real. And in reality, he did make him touchable. It's just the, the, the issue is this. We got to believe somebody else's story behind it. That's right. Because, oh, man, that's good. Because, look, in, in Peter's epistle, Peter said, we are not telling you about cunningly devised fables. Come on. Ooh. He said we were with him when, when, he sh when the glory shone about. Yeah. When he was on that mountain and he was transfigured before our very eyes, we saw the deity that was in him shine out of him. We experienced him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. John, the apostle, if you turn the page right there, John <laughs> says in his letter, he says that we're telling you what we've experienced. Yes. And the reason that we're telling you what we've experienced is so that you can have fellowship with us as we have fellowship with God. Right. Come on. We were with him. We beheld him. That's what John says. John says <laughs> that we beheld him with our eyes. And if you could read it in the Greek, the idea is, is that it was so powerful what we saw with our eyes. It's as though it's burned on the retina of our mind. We, what we saw with our physical eyes was so powerful that it's still like I still see it like it was yesterday. We heard him with our ears. And in the Greek, it'd be like to the point where it's still ringing in our ears currently. Yes. Even after he's died, resurrected, ascended to the Father, it's still ringing in our ears. Yes. We touched him, John said. We handled the word of life, the very word that spoke the worlds into existence, that became flesh, dwelt amongst us, tabernacled with us. We handled him, the word of life. We handled him with our hands. So God did, whether the naysayers want to believe it or not, God did provide Himself in physical form. We yes. just got to believe somebody else's testimony. Yes. Bad on you if you choose not Amen. to believe another person's testimony. Amen. The, you know, this is a, this is just popped in my head too. There was a there's a story about this guy named Lee Strobel, I believe, right? The Case for Christ. Amen. Yeah, I kind of watched the video, and you know what's what's really cool about this? He was an intellectual guy, but I think he was like a journalist. All right? And he was an atheist. And he didn't want nothing to do with the Lord. And you know what he thought? What he was going to do with his old wisdom and his smart self? He was going to do an investigative reporting and he was going to prove that God wasn't real. <laughs> and you know what happened to that dude? He got saved. He did the investigative report and the conclusion that he came to was God is real and I better get my heart to him. Amen. Amen? So the world can say whatever it is that they want. They can try to apply the science. I got off the beaten trail. The main point is this, is that God, when he searches, he produces a people. He has a place for his people. He has a purpose for his people. Amen. One day we're going to be with him. In the meantime, Jesus says, I'm not asking you to take them out of here. I'm just asking you to keep them from the evil one. Amen. And in the midst of all of this, hallelujah, his word Makes us different. Yes. That's really what makes us different, folks. The, the Holy Spirit living in us and the Word of God and the Holy Spirit working together, changing us. Yes, hallelujah. Whenever I first got saved, man, I'm telling you, I just thought I was all that, boy. <laughs> I called my, wrote a letter to my sister, man, you doing this wrong, you doing that wrong, you, man, you wrong, and I'm thinking I'm right, and... And now I realize the only thing that makes me different than the worldly, I call them worldlings. The only thing that makes me different is the fact that the Holy Spirit lives in my heart. Yes. And that I've been given access to the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. If it wouldn't be for that, I'd be no different than them. That's right. Amen? All right, last point right here. Point number four. His people don't move backwards, but the world can move forward. Amen? Look at Genesis 24.6. Abraham said unto him, Beware th thou that you bring not my son there again. Right. Don't you go backwards. Come on. Abraham had left his former life and he waited for the promises of God. It wasn't God's will for Abraham to go backwards and move back to where he was before. But it is God's will to welcome the people from their old life to come to the new one that we found. Listen, there was an old 
way. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but he liveth in me. I literally, in the mind of God, died with Jesus at Calvary. I was buried with him, and I've been resurrected to newness of life. Listen, it's important that we understand something. There's a death side of Calvary, but there's also a resurrection side of Calvary. Amen? On this side, Adam dies. But on this side, hallelujah, the new man lives. Praise yeah, God. Yeah. We are connected together with him in his death. But we're also connected together with him in his resurrection power and life. That's what brings me to 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Praise God. Listen, I know... We, we don't celebrate Easter. We celebrate the resurrection. Right. Amen. Amen. We don't celebrate Santa Claus. Well, we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Right. Amen. We, and we don't even... What is it? Halloween. I don't even know what that is. But that's another story for another time. We ain't even, Okay. But let me just say this. That early Sunday morning, Jesus rose from the dead. A new day dawned. He rose on the eighth day. And I mean, it was the first Sunday, if you will, after that Passover. It was the Feast of First Fruits. There's so many firsts in all of this. He resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits. Right. The first fruit, the first portion of the harvest, a new, the new day of the week. When the, before the sun arose, but then with the, with the sun rises, there's a new day, amen? And the point that I'm trying to make is it's a fresh start. Just the old man dies in Adam and a new man is resurrected in Christ. Praise God. Amen. The scripture teaches that new life begins with death to the old one. Faith in Jesus and what he did for us on the cross causes a spiritual miracle to take place where the old man dies that was born of Adam. And a new man is resurrected to yeah. newness of life. Amen. That is the life of the believer. And that is the offer to the world. You can't have both. You can't say you're living for Jesus, but you're still living in the same old neighborhood. Rebecca can't say that she will marry Isaac, but stay in Nahor. It's not going to work. And we can't say that we are living for Jesus, but we're still in the world. Actually, I had a point. Another last point. Point number five. Five points. And we're still going to get out of here at a decent time. How do you like that? The thought of us, so, so listen, the thought of us asking others to come, to come, <coughs> brings me to my last point. His love compels the servant to go and tell others. Amen? Look at this. Genesis chapter 24, verse 5. The servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. And now look at verse 8. Genesis 24, verse 8. And if the woman will not be willing to follow you, then you shall be clear, clear from this my oath. It won't be your fault if she doesn't. Right. Ultimately, the servant is a type of the Holy Spirit. We talked about this. Eliezer is a type of the Holy Spirit. He's searching through the land. He's sending the message. But can I tell you something? God uses believers. Yeah. Eliezer is also a type of the believer filled with the Holy Spirit, sent and commissioned on a mission to tell others about the good news of Jesus. Hey, come see the son, just like the Samaritan woman. When God got a hold of her, right, she went back to the village. Come see a man who told me everything about me. And the Bible says when he looked up, the, the, the whole village was coming back. Yes. Amen. In a sense, he, Eliezer describes both the Holy Spirit and the submitted believer working together to accomplish the work of God. Look at real quick, John 15, 26 through 27. This is Jesus talking. This is, now, this, this part of the message is letting you know that no matter what the modern day pr church preaches, it is God's will for God's people to let others know about his goodness Amen. and the fact that he wants them to be married. Amen to his son. Yes. But when the comforter is come, Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the spirit of truth which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me, and you also shall bear witness. Not just him, but you too. He's going to work in you and through you, because you have been with me from the beginning. Yes, he's talking to the literal disciples, but guess what? 
Disciples literally means a learner of Christ. Hallelujah. All those that have connected themselves to Jesus. All those that desire to do the will of the Lord. Amen. Are disciples for the Lord. Now look at John chapter 16 verses 7 through 9. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient. Fancy word for meaning it's a good thing for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove, another word for convict, the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. And he goes on to talk about some other things, but I wanted to say this. The Holy Spirit operates through the lives of believers and the presence of God in the believer and the presence of God's word convict the world of sin. Listen, the cross is the climax of the effect of sin on humanity. Jesus had to hang naked on a cross and die for the sin of humanity. The Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin when the story of Jesus dying on the cross... They can believe it's a fable if that's what they choose to do. But when the Holy Spirit moves upon the heart, when that story is told, listen, he'll begin to prick the heart, convict the heart and say, sin is so bad that God had to bankrupt heaven of its most prized possession and sin Jesus to die on the cross for your sin, for my sin. That's how the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. And you know how it convicts the world of righteousness? Because he rose again. Yeah. He was the righteous one. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Death had no right to hold him down. Jesus came busting out the grave. Good news for you. One day there's going to be a resurrection of the body of Christ and you also can be busted out of the grave. It also will convict the world of judgment. It's going to convict the world. It's going to prove to the world that there's a judgment coming. Why is that? Because the devil is being judged. That's what Jesus was saying. Devil saying, he, the prince of this world has come, but he has none of me. And that he was going to be judged. All of his work was judged at Calvary. All of his work and what he did to mankind was judged at Calvary. Jesus fulfilled the law, died on the cross, fulfilling the, and paid the penalty for mankind. Amen. This is the message. This is the message that must be preached. Genesis 24, 5, peradventure the, the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. I'm talking about being compelled by God to tell others. There will be some who choose to follow. There will be some who don't. There are some people who don't want to leave Nahor. They don't want to leave the world that they know in exchange for the new life to marry the son. It's not our responsibility to make them change. It's not our responsibility to make them submit to the truth. We cannot do that. If she won't follow, she won't follow. Our responsibility is to tell her about the son and give her the opportunity to make the decision. We don't have to go there, but it's in Ezekiel chapter 3 if you want to read it later. It talks about a watchman on a wall. Back in those days, they would have a tower, they would have a watchman on the wall, and he would signal if danger was on the way. If there was a foreign army coming, he would blow the shofar to allow the military to be aware that danger was coming. God uses that for Ezekiel in a spiritual sense. You're my watchman. And you need to sound the alarm and you need to let the sinner know that he's in his sin. And if he dies in his sin and you told him and he, turned, he chose not to turn, then guess what? His own blood is on his own hands. But if you didn't do what you were supposed to do, then his blood is on your hands. Now, I will tell you this. Whenever people used to use that passage of scripture, it used to almost weigh me down and condemn me and make me feel like if I didn't tell every single human being that I knew, and it's probably true, we should probably be telling every single human being that we know about the good news of Jesus Christ. At the same time, let me just say this. If you try to do it in your own flesh, you're going to ruin it. Yes. Amen. God will lead and guide you by his Holy Spirit and he will open up the doors, amen, for you to be able to speak. The That's truth it. that he desires spoken. Okay. And let me just say this other thing too. Sometimes it's not about as much about words as it is about actions. Now I used to get aggravated whenever preachers used to say this because I think that they were saying it to try to get to let people off. In other words, you know, oh, you don't have to talk about the Lord. Just just live 
just live your life right. Well, you can live your life right, and somebody wouldn't even know if you know if, if they never knew you were a Christian, they could have thought you were a Buddhist for all they knew. Right. Right? You just treat us right. so good. No, in some way, shape, or form, people ne need to know that you are a child of God. Now, I will tell you this there's a lot of times there's people that got different personalities. Everybody's personality is like James and mine. Out, you know, outgoing and whatnot. No, sometimes people have reserved personalities. Right. Amen. And they can be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And their form of telling other people about Jesus might look different than ours. Right. God uses everybody. He ain't trying to make us all look the same. No, that's right. Right. Amen. But it's, I guess what I'm trying to say is that sometimes there's a great value in just the fact that people have made it known that they do live for the Lord. And as they live out their life in front of the world, that they live different than what the world does. And it's a testimony, amen, to compel them to come and marry the Son.